Welcome everyone. We're going to wait a minute to let some people enter the Zoom webinar room and then we'll get started. Okay, I'll wait one more minute and then we'll get started. Welcome everyone. All right, well, why don't we get started? Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us here today. I'm Linda Mitchell, CEO for Allergy and Asthma Network. Welcome to this afternoon's webinar. I'm looking forward to hearing um, Dr. Merchant talk about aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease. We have a few housekeeping items before we start today's program. First, all participants will be on mute for this webinar. We will be recording today's webinar and we'll post it on our website within a few days. You can find all of our recorded webinars on our website at allergyasthmanetwork.org. All you have to do is scroll to the bottom of the page to find the webinars and then you can find the recordings there if you just click on the look at older webinars link. This webinar will be one hour in length and that includes time for questions. We will take those questions at the end of the webinar, but you can put your questions in the Q&A box at any time. The Q&A box is at the bottom of your screen. Um, we have some monitoring the chat if you have any questions you put in there or if you need any other kind of help. We will get to as many questions as we can before we conclude today's webinar. We offer this webinar in partnership with the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. Members of the college are eligible to receive CME for this webinar through the college member website. For everyone else, we will be offering a certificate of attendance if you need it for your records. A few days after the webinar, you will receive an email with supplemental information about the webinar topic and a link to the recording, as well as a link to download a copy of the certificate of attendance. We will also try to add the link to the certificate in the chat, but sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. So let's get started. Today's topic is aspirin exacerbated respiratory disease and the role of type two inflammation. AERD is a condition that impacts more than 1 million people in the US. People with AERD live with asthma, sinus disease and recurrent nasal polyps and are sensitive to aspirin and other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Today, Dr. Merchant will review the symptoms, causes, diagnosis, management, and treatment options for those living with this challenging condition. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Rajan Merchant. Dr. Merchant is an allergy, asthma, and clin clinical immunology specialist at the Woodland Clinic Medical Group, which is part of Common Spirit Health and Dignity Health Medical Foundation in Woodland, California. Dr. Merchant focuses on adult and pediatric seasonal and perennial allergic rhinitis, asthma diagnosis and management, food allergy, drug allergy, and immunodeficiency disorders. He is a fellow of the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, and won the Sacramento Magazine Top Doc Award from 2016 to 2022. Thank you for being here today, Dr. Merchant. I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you, Linda. Good afternoon, and, and thank you for that introduction and for everybody joining this webinar, um, again, hosted by the Allergy and Asthma Network and sponsored by the um, ACAI. Uh, today is uh, September 26th and is actually Aspirin Exacerbated Respiratory Disease Day. And so I'm excited to, again, share some history and updates about this uh, unique condition. 
Here are my um, disclosures. I don't have any specific uh, conflicts that are associated with uh, this presentation as it uh, re you know, relates to my disclosures. And so we have uh, three uh, learning objectives uh, today um, that we'll try to focus on, uh, basically to identify the clinical features associated with AERD, uh, describe some of the components of type two inflammation, and go over some of the basic uh, treatment options and recommendations for management associated with this disease. So before we get started on actually talking about AERD, I wanted to provide some uh, historical context. Uh, willow trees, as uh, pictured here, have been uh, long known for medicinal purposes and was known to have properties to reduce fever and pain. Um, this was actually first described almost 1,500 years ago by Pedonius Discoridis, a Greek physician, pharmacologist, and botanist who wrote about the properties associated with uh, salicylic uh, acid. It was uh, actually uh, first purified by a German scientist in 1828 um, and then synthesized um, in 1859. And then 1897 is when uh, Felix uh, Hoffman, a scientist who was working for Bayer, um, actually produced acetyl salicylic acid uh, to reduce the bitterness that was associated with the original form and in 1899, that's when Bayer patented the drug and called it aspirin. Bayer aspirin is still widely recognized as the wonder drug and is the standard to which all other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs or NSAIDs are compared to. And so 1922 is when the first uh, reported uh, case of uh, aspirin-exacerbated respiratory disease was uh, described uh, by Widal et al. Um, at that point, it was just uh, focused on asthma uh, being worsened by aspirin. And in 1968 is when uh, Samter and Beer uh, published uh, The Intolerance of uh, Aspirin, where they described the classical triad as we sort of now know it to be, uh, where we had nasal polyps, uh, bronchial asthma, and aspirin hypersensitivity. Um, back then, it was, uh, again, uh, described as an acquired disease that develops usually in middle age and predominantly in non-atopic individuals. And so as Linda uh, mentioned, uh, AERD affects approximately 1.5 million people in the US. Approximately, again, 7% of adults who have asthma have AERD. And among patients with severe asthma, uh, the prevalence is almost twice as high. Um, about the same number of uh, individuals with chronic rhinosinusitis and nasal polyps uh, also have um, AERD estimated to be about 15%. However, there is a little bit of discrepancy as many patients, again, may not be aware of their sensitivity to NSAIDs. And in one study, almost 50% of uh, patients that were diagnosed with uh, chronic uh, rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps challenged with aspirin had features of AERD. Some risk factors that are associated with the disease. Uh, typically, again, this is uh, thought to be a non-atopic uh, condition, and so we see that uh, the majority of uh, individuals or triggers or risk factors are res associated with uh, respiratory tract infections. Allergen exposure, again, seems to be less prevalent as a whole, and again, um, uh, surprisingly, uh, aspirin or NSAID use is not a specific risk factor, um, but does obviously play a key role in the pathogenesis. Um, and, a, and a good number, or almost 30%, again, we don't really have a clear understanding of what triggers or what, you know, leads to the disease itself. So clinical features associated with uh, the disease, a fully developed ARD, usually, again, diagnosed in adults. Uh, we see progression of the disease over several years and sometimes decades. And that recognition of aspirin or NSAID sensitivity will also be dependent on the overall frequency and use in this age group. So typical symptoms start with rhinitis, uh, move on to, again, sinusitis and nasal polyp development, 
uh, asthma a couple of years later, and then the NSAID tolerance, again, anywhere between four years to um, up to a decade after the onset of uh, symptoms. Some key uh, clinical features. Obviously, we see respiratory features are, again, the primary components of AERD as based on the name. Um, but there are a number of non-respiratory symptoms that have also been associated in this um, uh, demographic or patient group. Uh, we know aspirin uh, or NSAIDs can trigger uh, urticaria and angioedema, and that is also seen in patients with AERD, as well as uh, some of the uh, classical GI symptoms that we see with use of NSAIDs and aspirin. Um, and some unusual symptoms uh, that may, again, sometimes be attributed to other diseases, uh, specifically hypotension, a loss of consciousness may be, you know, considered an anaphylactic reaction to NSAIDs um, or uh, aspirin, um, but uh, also, again, highly uh, likely, you know, to be a part of the disease process associated with uh, AERD. So generally, again, uh, most patients that have, um, you know, uh, AERD, uh, we see that 60% of patients, um, oops, go back a slide. Yeah, have, again, uh, a more severe course of uh, symptoms, uh, generally uh, more refractory disease compared to individuals who don't have AERD. Typically, um, patients uh, require, um, you know, greater levels of uh, medications and uh, treatments uh, that seem to be a little bit more resistant. So we see that patients with asthma, 60% are considered to be uh, severe asthma. Uh, 25 to 50% of these uh, patients are considered to be uncontrolled. Uh, and almost about a quarter of patients uh, that have uh, required uh, mechanical ventilation for asthma you know, we're sensitive to aspirin. Uh, over time, we do see that uh, the disease does lead to some fibrosis and airway uh, remodeling. Um, additional complications associated with nasal polyps, again, let me go back one slide, um, involve, again, recurring sinus infections, uh, facial deformations and uh, tympanic membrane perforation, as well as, again, sort of invasion into the brain with nasal polyps because of how aggressive they can be in terms of their development. So typically, again, we've talked about, again, sort of the features. The definition, again, is a combination of these three, you know, components of having asthma, uh, chronic rhinosinusitis and nasal polyps uh, with the key element that, again, inhibition of COX-1 uh, by aspirin or NSAIDs uh, within 20 minutes to up to three hours leads to a worsening of symptoms uh, with congestion or bronchoconstriction. Reactions to uh, NSAIDs or patients with ARD are considered to be pseudo-allergic. Uh, again, most uh, time we think of an uh, allergy being a type one or IgE mediated reaction. Uh, in, in the circumstance for AERD, these are pseudo allergic. It's an abnormal uh, pharmacological uh, manifestation of what's going on within the, um, um, within the physiology. Uh, and this was actually uh, described again by Samter back in 1968 when he had seen structurally different molecules that were you know, causing you know, similar reactions in terms of AERD manifestation. So here we see that a variety of NSAIDs that can inhibit uh, both COX-1 and COX-2. Uh, NSAIDs with strong COX-1 inhibition um, can induce AERD or uh, NERD, which is, again, non-steroidal uh, exacerbation of respiratory disease, which is, uh, again, sort of commonly used in Europe versus the AERD, which is used here in uh, the U.S. Um, and specific uh, uh, NSAIDs uh, such as meloxicam, uh, that are more selective COX-2 inhibitors, you know, do not seem to induce the symptoms associated. So it is really that COX-1 inhibition that seems to be the driver of uh, the, the diagnosis and the, and the pathogenesis. Oops. 
So before we go into, again, sort of the type two inflammation that's associated with the disease, a little bit of, again, the physiology. So aspirin or NSAIDs are, again, one component of this diagnosis. But the overall physiology, again, is a, is a complex, you know, dysregulation where we have um, uh, an increase of uh, leukotriene uh, C4 uh, and prostaglandin, um, you know, where we have a dysregulation of the anti-inflammatory and inflammatory mediators. So again, a little bit of uh, that described here, um, an increase uh, specifically of LTC4, uh, a decrease um, in PGE2 uh, as, a, as it relates to COX-2, uh, or sorry, COX-1 inhibition, uh, which then leads to, again, an activation of mast cells. And this is a little bit of a better visualization of that. Uh, we can see that uh, specific uh, markers of LTC4 or cystineal leukotrienes that, again, activate or induce uh, specific cytokines uh, that relate to mast cell activation, uh, and the mast cell activation then drives the inflammatory components leading to uh, basophils, T cells, and eosinophils being, um, you know, increased production. So specific to type two inflammation, uh, we see that the uh, particular interleukins that drive type two inflammation are associated with all three of the, the major phenotypes. So IL-4, uh, IL-5, and IL-13 um, are again, inflammatory um, signals that you know, cause cell trafficking to the specific tissues. Uh, we can see increases in IgE production, uh, as well as, again, barrier dysfunction, tissue remodeling, uh, smooth muscle proliferation and contractility, specifically when it talks to asthma, uh, some bio, um, uh, microbiome alterations associated with chronic sinusitis, uh, and hyperplasia and goblet cell uh, production, uh, leading to increased mucus uh, production. This again, nicely uh, gives us a, a very a good visual of all of the mechanisms that are in going on with regards to both the inflammatory pieces and the, and the anti-inflammatory component where um, PGE2 uh, is being inhibited by aspirin. Uh, and again, this pathway is a little bit different than what we see with the atopic pathway where the uh, ILC2 cell, uh, which again, sort of drives the, um, type two inflammation and leads to IgE production. Uh, here we see that the dysregulation of the cystineal leukotrienes and the increase in the prostaglandins, these pro-inflammatory mediators really are the mechanisms which activate the mast cells. And then those pieces uh, lead to the increase in the type two um, mediators associated with the inflammation. And so we go back to this uh, triad of uh, what's going on. Um, so the aspirin or NSAID hypersensitivity, again, uh, inhibits or, or decreases PGE2, which again is the stabilizer for mast cells, mast cell activation um, because of this dysregulation of prostas, you know, glandins and, and leukotrienes, you know, leads to an increased um, pro-inflammatory, you know, condition, which then uh, allows the mast cells to uh, drive the uh, um, type two inflammation, leading to you know the mechanisms of asthma and um, you know worsening of the nasal polyps and, and sinus, sinus disease that we see in terms of the severity. So the overall uh, next step is you know sort of going over the the different recommendations and treatments associated with the management of um, AERD. Uh, the basic goals of treatment are, are not that, you know, dissimilar to uh, treating asthma or, you know, nasal polyps, um, basically control asthma symptoms, uh, try to manage the underlying inflammatory pieces associated with chronic rhinosinusitis, prevent, again, nasal polyp regrowth. And for most individuals, again, sort of understanding that this is a lifelong process of uh, an underlying disease and that, you know, will take, uh, you know, you know, some, you know, time to get the treatments, you know, uh, to be uh, optimal and that there can be uh, setbacks based on, again, various triggers that may come into uh, play. So for 
most individuals, uh, uh, specifically for asthma, um, a trial of uh, leukotriene modifying agents, again, will probably be beneficial uh, to help uh, decrease or uh, inhibit the um, effects of the increased uh, leukotriene productions, uh, whether this is uh, with uh, Montelukast uh, specifically or uh, with uh, Xylutin, which affects the 5-lipoxygenase uh, pathway. Um, both can be uh, used uh, to uh, modify the uh, activity or severity associated with AERD. Specifically, avoidance of obviously COX-1 um, uh, NSAIDs, uh, you know, a key player of uh, treatment. And then, um, you know, we'll go over a little bit about the biologics uh, associated with uh, type 2 inflammation. So counseling and avoidance, um, you know, of patients of uh, identifying all of the different mechanisms of COX-1 inhibitors, uh, including uh, Tylenol, uh, which can be uh, at a high dose, a weak uh, COX-1 inhibitor. So trying to identify, you know, medications that patients can well tolerate when they do need it for specific indications. Uh, foods uh, also play a key role. Again, we, we know that salicylic acid was derived from, again, uh, natural substances uh, found. And again, most medicinal products are, are found from uh, food or plant derivatives. And so understanding where uh, these uh, foods uh, contain high levels of salicylic acid uh, would be, again, a key uh, role. And also uh, knowing that most individuals, even with uh, careful avoidance, you know, likely will continue to have disease progression, uh, even with avoidance, as again, the underlying mechanism is, again, a dysregulation of the inflammatory and anti-inflammatory mediators, and that inhibition of COX-1 uh, with NSAIDs or aspirin um, just exacerbates the entire, you know, um, physiology. So this uh, table, again, gives us a nice overview of all of the different treatment options associated. Again, most of these uh, treatments are very similar to treatments that we currently use for underlying allergic rhinitis, uh, sinusitis, uh, nasal polyp disease, and or asthma. Uh, we usually will always start with topical steroids as a way to control uh, disease and inflammation, um, leukotriene modifying uh, drugs as stated uh, to, to block the leukotriene effects. Uh, oral steroids when severity seems to be particularly, you know, problematic or, or affecting, again, multi-organs. Uh, inhaled steroids, again, similar for asthma management. Uh, and then, again, a key component uh, of treatment, uh, aspirin desensitization, uh, to actually uh, improve or reduce the symptom severity associated with AERD. Um, this was actually first described, aspirin desensitization, in 1922, when Waddell actually uh, diagnosed the di uh, aspirin-associated uh, respiratory disease. He actually did a desensitization during that time and was able to show that individuals who were desensitized were able to have less severe or less frequent exacerbations. Uh, subsequently, again, described in 1970, and then most recently, uh, when it became more um, uh, widely used uh, when Dr. Stevenson uh, in 1980 documented the sustained benefit after desensitizing patients and um, where the Scripps uh, protocol for uh, aspirin desensitization sort of became standard of care. Typically, all patients who have uh, aspirin-exacerbated respiratory disease can be desensitized to aspirin. Um, patients who can take daily aspirin without uh, adverse side effects once they have been uh, desensitized. And desensitization can be generally maintained indefinitely as long as the patients, again, take aspirin regularly. Uh, typically, if they uh, stop treatment for a couple of days, again, they lose that protective uh, uh, components and you know, will likely react to aspirin or NSAIDs. Um, uh, within a few days of stopping daily treatment uh, as the desensitization sort of wears off. Surgical management, again, is a key component. Uh, nasal polyps, uh, again, play a significant role and cause a significant, um, you know, a role in quality of life. Uh, and so generally when medications uh, are not allowing to reduce symptoms or, or impairing a quality of life, surgical management had been, again, a key uh, player uh, to try to reduce uh, symptoms, uh, usually with a polypectomy or endoscopic sinus surgery um, were the initial recommendations. Uh, the biggest challenge with surgeries was that uh, treatment usually led to a recurrence of nasal polyps, 
usually um, at a much, again, faster rate than individuals who did not have AERD. And then specifically now talking about, again, the monoclonal antibodies um, associated with um, you know, treatment for type 2 inflammation. Uh, we have a couple of different targets that have been uh, looked at for uh, AERD or with AERD. Um, Anti-IgE treatment with omalizumab, uh, anti-IL-5 treatment with mepolizumab, uh, benralizumab or resolizumab, uh, and then anti-IL-4, anti-IL-13 uh, with uh, dupilumab. And so here, again, we try to illustrate how these um, specific um, monoclonal antibodies can um, affect the inflammatory pathways. And we can see that the different um, targets for uh, these uh, inflammatory uh, mediators, that is these uh, interleukins that cause or drive the inflammation, can be blocked and where we can then have an improvement in uh, disease um, severity, uh, disease modification, uh, and disease, um, you know, um, uh, elements uh, where um, other uh, treatments may have not worked, uh, particularly when we talk about uh, topical or inhaled steroids uh, or nasal steroids for disease management. So with regards to IgE or anti-IgE therapy, again, there was a study uh, published, again, um, back in 2019, looking at the effects of omalizumab in patients with AERD, uh, they saw that there was, again, a significant reduction in the total number of steroid courses and, and total use of Saba uh, while patients were on omalizumab during their first year. Um, concordantly, again, the treatment was only beneficial if, again, IgE or um, uh, ATP was um, noted. Uh, patients who uh, did not have a significant, um, you know, factor for A to P or allergy, uh, did not seem to have the same level of uh, benefit with omalizumab. Um, there was, again, another component of uh, looking at uh, omalizumab where there was a, a decrease in uh, urinary LTE4 uh, and a reduction in uh, overall cystineal leukotriene production uh, and led to NSAID tolerance uh, on patients who were on omalizumab. And this was again published back in 2020. When it goes to specific uh, treatment regarding uh, anti IL 5, uh, mepolizumab has been studied and was shown to improve both upper airway symptoms, including anosmia, congestion, and asthma control in patients. Again, this was a retrospective look at patients uh, that were on mepolizumab uh, and uh, known to have AERD. Um, I did not, you know, specifically see any uh, clear clinical trials looking at benralizumab or resolizumab uh, with AERD, although these, again, would work similarly uh, with IL-5 uh, inhibition. And then finally, uh, you know, the dual uh, uh, therapy targeting IL-4 uh, alpha receptor with dupilumab, uh, again, highly effective as add-on therapy for patients with uh, nasal polyps and AERD, uh, again, reported outcomes uh, to decrease sinus inflammation, uh, sinus uh, uh, imaging, uh, and the markers associated with T2 uh, inflammation. And here we have, again, sort of a nice outline uh, that looks at all of the different uh, monoclonal antibodies, as well as uh, aspirin uh, treatment with uh, desensitization across a variety of um, uh, um, you know, uh, clinical uh, components with regards to symptoms as well as adverse events. Uh, and uh, the top line, again, specific to dupilumab showed the uh, greatest uh, you know, sort of benefit uh, with the least among uh, side effect profile um, with regards to um, patients who have uh, chronic uh, sinusitis with nasal polyps. Um, the one key piece of, uh, you know, this uh, table that I think is fascinating is that, again, initially prior to monoclonals being available, uh, aspirin desensitization was, again, the mainstay of treatment for most of these patients um, uh, on top of, again, the topical steroids. Um, and we see a clear benefit from aspirin desensitization, but there is a greater side effect profile that was, again, um, less appreciated at the time. Uh, and then when we look at, again, sort of a, a greater 
um, you know, uh, view, uh, we see that uh, aspirin uh, desensitization does have, again, uh, a greater side effect and is again uh, considered to be more harmful than beneficial, uh, you know, with management. And so there has been a little bit of a shift of, you know, maybe not using aspirin desensitization uh, as much, given that we have some other uh, treatment options um, where the overall risk benefit profile may favor uh, not using aspirin desensitization anymore. So in summary, uh, basically AERD or NERD, again, is defined as an asthma with a chronic uh, rhinosinusitis, nasal polyps with worsening symptoms associated with aspirin or NSAID use uh, that specifically inhibits COX-1 uh, inhibition. Again, it, this is a complex uh, dysregulation of pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory anti mediators uh, that lead to an increase in LTC4 and a decrease in PGE2 production, which affects uh, mast cells. Uh, this uh, dysregulation as a whole leads to an increase in type 2 inflammation with increases in, again, IL-4, IL-5, and IL-13. Treatment, again, basically has uh, evolved around, you know, treating the underlying conditions, so pharmacological options to treat uh, asthma, uh, and nasal polyps and sinusitis with topical steroids, a surgical management for the individuals who have significant uh, sinus disease to open up the nasal and or endoscop um, sinus passages. Uh, aspirin desensitization, again, was a hallmark of treatment um, and maybe, again, considered to be uh, maybe a little bit less of a consideration uh, now that we have some uh, specific uh, treatments uh, targeting um, type 2 inflammation, where the risk-benefit profile uh, seems to favor use of uh, biologics over uh, aspirin desensitization, but still, again, an option for treatment uh, that may be uh, discussed with uh, patients as you go through the different options and where they may respond. And that comes to the end of the uh, presentation, um, and uh, we will be ready to take it up for questions. Thank you, Dr. Merchant. Really informative. It's a very complex topic. So um, really, you deciphered that very well. And I appreciate you kind of going through it in a very clear manner. Um, so we'll go ahead and we'll um, take some questions and answers. I didn't get a whole lot of questions, but I do have some for you. So let me go ahead and ask them. So is there any contraindication to aspirin desensitization in these patients? Yeah, there's not a clear contraindication of, you know, aspirin desensitization. It still works, you know, extremely well to reduce symptoms and to uh, reduce the inflammatory conditions that are associated with it. I think the, the biggest challenge associated with aspirin desensitization is, again, the potential for needing high doses of treatment over a sustained period of time. And that, um, you know, the, the biggest negative, you know, um, outside of uh, some of the um, harms that may be associated um, are that if you, you know, stop treatment or, or forget to take treatment over a couple of days, you know, you lose that sort of productive benefit and have to go through that desensitization process again to be able to go back to uh, tolerating uh, aspirin. The, the main benefit, I think, that aspirin desensitization provides uh, where monoclonals may not be, you know, necessarily um, known yet. Uh, again, we see a little bit with omalizumab, you know, showing a benefit where other NSAIDs are tolerated. Uh, is that you can use uh, COX-1 inhibitors, um, you know, with aspirin desensitization uh, to be able to use, um, you know, those um, uh, other medications, whereas, again, they may not still be available for use uh, with a monoclonal antibody because you would still likely, you know, potentially exacerbate symptoms with use. Okay, thank you for that. So for my information, I don't know if anybody else is wondering. So if you do aspirin desensitization, does that also desensitize to NSAIDs? Yeah, typically you can better tolerate all NSAIDs under aspirin desensitization. So uh, whether that's, uh, uh, you know, ibuprofen or, or um, you know, any of the other COX-1 inhibitors, they are all better tolerated or uh, not likely to, you know, cause an exacerbation of the underlying uh, physiology uh, when you are on aspirin desensitization. Okay, very interesting. So um, do, and you might've said this and I missed it, but do all patients that have AERD also have type two inflammation or just a subset of the patients with AERD? 
Yeah, so all patients do uh, seem to manifest this type 2 inflammation um, associated with AERD. Uh, there is a little bit of a, again, a driving factor where, you know, which comes first? Is it the, the dysregulation that starts to develop that then leads to some of the inflammatory conditions? Um, or are there other mechanisms that are leading to the inflammation? And again, I think the clear difference is in atopy, you know, we see the, the mechanisms, you know, driving the inflammation earlier uh, in life and, and where we get a higher level of IgE production uh, versus, again, in AERD, uh, that seems to be a lesser component of the pathophysiology and, uh, again, being mediated by those respiratory infections or triggers uh, seem to be a driving factor leading to that inflammatory, you know, state. Got it. Um, one of the questions from the audience, what pain relievers do you recommend if there is no aspirin desensitization done? Yeah, so typically I would say, you know, uh, meloxicam, which is again, a selective COX-2 um, or, or uh, you know, a celecoxib, a, a celebrex, uh, which is a COX-2 uh, as well, are probably pretty well tolerated medications that don't seem to, you know, cause any specific uh, issues associated with AERD. Okay. Um, has any of the recent COVID research shown any new clues regarding AERD and the loss of smell? That's a good question. I'm not directly aware of any specific studies looking at COVID and anosmia, and if that has any clear, you know, components where uh, it drives the inflammatory conditions. Um, that's not to say that there, there there isn't any. I'm just not aware of them. Okay. Um, do any foods exacerbate or cause additional inflammation for patients with AERD? Yeah, so there is an entire list of foods and probably a topic of itself where you can talk about all of the different, you know, ways that aspirin or, or salicylic acid is found uh, in, you know, both natural substances as well as, again, in other, you know, forms. And, um, you know, there are, again, foods that have high um, levels of salicylic acid, which would then drive some of the inflammatory components associated with AERD. I didn't go through a list of those, but those are commonly available. Um, and again, uh, can be uh, something that can be looked up to say, here are foods that contain salicylic acid or high levels of salicylic acid, which would then be things that you would want to um, try to avoid. So that's a low salicylate diet. Basically. Correct. Yes. yes. Okay. Yes. Very interesting. Okay. Um, let me see. So I, I noticed through this presentation you were using CRSWNP. So that's a that's a sub that's a piece of this whole constellation of problems that are all part of AERD. Is that correct? Yeah. So depending on again sort of the definition and sort of how um, you know uh, different you know um, ways of uh, you know the physiology. Uh, some describe, uh, you know, having uh, chronic uh, rhinosinusitis with nasal polyps uh, as one, you know, component. Um, others describe, you know, uh, both of those as independent factors, but, you know, fall in actually not as a triad, but as a, a tetralogy of, of having asthma, uh, chronic sinusitis, nasal polyps, and aspirin, in, you know, sensitivity or, or NSAID in sensi you know, sensitivity. And so, um, but, but that is a key element that you have to have nasal polyps and uh, sinusitis, you know, as, uh, you know, based on imaging or, uh, you know, underlying a visualization of both to be able to, you know, really characterize this as AERD. Thank you. Um, is there any effects on the liver on aspirin desensitization and daily aspirin therapy that has to be conducted after desensitization? Um. So I don't think there's specific effects on the liver that require liver monitoring on aspirin therapy. Uh, most of the symptoms associated, again, are going to be GI related. Again, a little bit of a higher risk for bleeding disorders associated. Um, so those are the things that we typically worry about, but you don't have to specifically monitor, you know, liver function or, you know, kidney function on aspirin desensitization. Okay. And is there a standard dose of aspirin that's taken like a baby aspirin or some, some other dose or does it vary? Yeah, sorry. And I didn't go into, you know, the details of, of the dosing, but typically it is a high dose of aspirin. So anywhere from, 
uh, 650 milligrams, you know, once a day to twice a day. So some some of the literature has a high dose of 650 twice a day, um, and others say after a period of time, 650 milligrams once a day um, can be used. Um, but it is a high dose of aspirin on a daily regimen uh, that is recommended for ongoing treatment. Okay. Um, what are the goals of AERD therapy from a 30,000 foot perspective. Yeah. So the goals of therapy ultimately, again, are, you know, primarily to, you know, try to keep patients as symptomatic uh, and or free of symptoms as possible, just like uh, for all of the underlying conditions, you know, try to control their asthma, understand, you know, what's going to drive their asthma in terms of symptoms or triggers. Uh, similarly for the chronic uh, sinusitis, you know, components or nasal polyps, you know, obviously try to minimize nasal polyp growth. Uh, try to minimize the recurrence of, you know, active infections or, you know, inflammation underlying, you know, in terms of the, the sinusitis. Uh, and, and ultimately, again, trying to maintain high quality of life in terms of uh, treatments, you know, that are, you know, you know, potentially, um, you know, lifelong in terms of the burden of, you know, disease. So if you're having to take, you know, treatments with, you know, nasal steroids, uh, inhaled steroids, uh, you know, oral, you know, tablets, uh, to try to control it, um, you know, that, you know, also adds a, a, a pretty, you know, significant uh, stressor in terms of, you know, daily management, uh, you know, outside of just the disease itself. And so, you know, sometimes simplifying these regimens or options with uh, the, you know, newer um, type two um, mediators of, for the biologics, you know, may actually, you know, reduce the, the burden of disease uh, and the impact, uh, as well as uh, improve overall control and in inflammation. Okay. Um, is there a preferred surgical method if someone chooses surgery? You know, I'm not the surgeon, so I couldn't tell you if there's a preferred surgical method. You know, I think it depends on how extensive the nasal polyps are and how extensive the underlying, you know, sinus inflammation is. Uh, again, if uh, typical treatments you know, haven't been working or disease has progressed, you know, the surgeons will obviously go through a variety of options. Uh, generally speaking, again, if uh, they've already had one, you know, surgery done with polypectomy and ethmoidectomy, you know, typically there's not more to do in the sinuses and they'll just continue to try to, you know, cut out the nasal polyps on reoccurring surgeries. Okay. And let's see, is there any other questions from the audience? I'll ask an, another question is, uh, you know, with the advent of the new drug treatment options with biologics and with uh, the availability of aspirin desensitization, would you say that if someone does have a diagnosis of AERD, that they do have some hope for an effective treatment option among what's available now? Yeah, certainly. I think there are, again, a number of treatment options that are very effective, including aspirin desensitization, as well as the uh, monoclonal uh, antibodies, you know, targeting the type 2 inflammation. Both of them uh, lead to, again, a general improvement in symptoms, a reduction in severity, uh, and again, sort of prevent or decrease, uh, you know, progression of disease and, and the need for, you know, recurring surgeries, particularly for nasal polyps and and um, you know, sinus uh, issues, uh, you know, all of the treatments have been very effective. And um, a, a number of uh, studies have now looked at where, again, treatment early may even lead to a decreased need for surgical intervention uh, for chronic, you know, sinusitis and nasal polyps. And so I think there are lots of options. I think the biggest challenge is, again, understanding that this progression uh, can happen over, you know, four or five or, or you know, more years before it gets recognized. You know, they may have already had a sinus surgery um, because it presented with sinus symptoms before the other components were presented. And so I think that's one of those elements is that we know this is a progressive uh, disease and that uh, initial symptoms may warrant a treatment uh, that, you know, start out with one option, uh, but as the disease progresses, uh, it becomes easier to recognize or, or determine that this is, again, actually AERD and not just, you know, sinusitis or something else, and that uh, then we can target these other treatments. Um, and there's also, again, some data that may come out that suggests that early treatment with uh, monoclonals, because again, uh, monoclonals, uh, you know, are now, you know, specifically approved for nasal polyps and sinusitis. And so maybe treatment 
um, may prevent, you know, you know, progression of disease. And that may be yet to be determined. But again, I think there's some interesting literature, you know, looking at those elements as well. Well, thank you. Um, I just want to tell the audience, if you need resources, educational resources for patients and caregivers regarding AERD, we do have a number of them on our website, and you'll get information about those in the follow-up email that happens after this webinar. In a day or two, you'll see that, uh, along with a link to the recording. So, Dr. Dr. Merchant, that's about the last of the questions that we have for you. Um, very interesting. I learned a lot. I really appreciate your time today. Um, and thank you for joining us. I'll, I'll just go ahead and move on to announcing the next webinar, which will be on October 5th. It's Real World Tobacco Cessation Strategies and Under-Resourced Community. It's with Dr. Jessica Fino, who um, has a program like this that she leads in her, um, in her community. And you'll learn more about that. Um, thank you again, Dr. Merchant, for joining us. Really do appreciate it. Our next Advances webinar is going to be on October 19th, um, where we'll welcome Dr. Clint Dunn to discuss a topic dermatitis, jack inhibitors, and beyond. Um, and like I said, you'll receive an email from Zoom in a few days with a link to the recording, link to those AERD resources that I referenced, and, um, and other information that will assist you um, with the diagnosis of AERD patient education. Thank you again for all of us at Allergy and Asthma Network. Join us as we work every day to, for everyone to breathe better together. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Merchant. Thank you.